An old preacher once said, If you have a big God, your troubles become small. So let's do our best to study God. Psalm 139, 1 through 3. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knoweth my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandeth my thoughts afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. Psalm 147, verse 5. Great is our Lord, and of great power. His understanding is infinite. Ezekiel, chapter 11, verse 5. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me, and said unto me, Speak. Thus saith the Lord, Thus ye said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. After this sermon, I want you to be blown away at one of the most wonderful and quite frankly scariest attributes of God, His omniscience. When we say God is omniscient, we mean that He knows everything that there is to know. He is all-knowing. Think about it. There are no secrets to Him. There is nothing outside of the scope of his wisdom, understanding, or attention. His knowledge is perfect. For you and I to learn, we have to study or go through experience. But God doesn't. He knows everything. There is never anything that ever happened or that will ever happen that God is unaware of. More so, there is nothing that can defy the understanding and wisdom of the Most High. He knows everything about everyone. He knows everything about you. Not the you you present to others, the real you. Not the you you present at church. He knows the real you. A man once said, I've been married to my wife for 43 years, and there is still stuff about her that surprises me. There is nothing you can do in your life that will surprise God. He is all-knowing. God has never been surprised, never in the history of God has he had to say, well, I didn't see that coming. God knows everything about everyone. Before you make a decision, God knew what you would decide, and God knew the repercussions of your decision. Not only does he know the repercussions of your decisions, He knows every single possible repercussion for every single decision you could have made. God sees everything at all times. There is no secret society that God is unaware of. There is no sin that God is not aware of. There is no place God is not aware of. God knows everything and sees everything. I wonder at the way many people think they can hide from God and do things without his awareness. God made us in the excellence of his wisdom, 
and gave us just a little fraction of his ability. It therefore baffles me how humans think they can make a fool of God. God does not need to leave heaven to know what's going on in the earth realm. His eyes are everywhere and his wisdom is all encompassing. The Bible records that the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. We have become so self-efficient and smart as a society that many people think that they've outgrown God. We have billionaires introducing self-driving cars, cars that park themselves. We have artificial intelligence slowly being shifted into our lives. We are all connected by the internet. You are probably listening to me right now through the internet. Civilization has taken so many leaps and bounds and has even moved to space exploration. Through our atmosphere and into the heavens, we are even aiming for the colonization of Mars. Mankind has taken on great leaps and bounds. We are living in a futuristic society. Humanity really thinks it is the apex of knowledge. Slowly and slowly, we can see more and more people believing we as a society have outgrown God. The irony is that we only know what God allows us to know. The wisest people, philosophers and teachers of the law, do not even come close next to the wisdom and power of the Lord. Our wisdom and our intelligence does not compete even on our best days. God is in a league of his own. In the excellency of God's wisdom, he does not need to ask questions before he knows what is within the heart of man. When Prophet Samuel wanted to anoint Eliab as king over Israel, the Lord forbade him, saying, Man looks at the outward appearance, but I, the Lord, look at the heart. God is never limited by the physical appearance of people. He sees deep within the hearts and knows the thoughts which they conceive in their minds. God cannot be limited by any physical barrier. He knows all things, and his wisdom cannot be superseded. King David took his time to study the personality of the Most High, and he came to the realization of the fact that God was acquainted with his ways. He knew and understood that none of his actions were hidden from God. If you go beneath the earth to commit sin, the wisdom of God will follow you up. There is nothing done in the secret that will not be brought to the limelight. If David had known this earlier, he would probably not have fallen into such sins. There is a wisdom that follows every action of man. It is the wisdom of God. Psalm 134, 4-6 says, For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain to it. You don't need to speak before God will hear your voice. The people of Israel grumbled in their hearts against God while they journeyed through the wilderness, and he knew it. A person could see you keeping quiet while before God, your voice of complaint is very loud in your heart. You may not be complaining out loud to God, but inwardly, you are complaining and angry with God. By the omniscience of God, 
Everything that happens on earth is being captured. Nothing is hidden from him. David admitted that the knowledge of God is too wonderful to be fathomed. It is too high to be attained. The Bible does not reveal a God who sits on the edge of his throne, anxiously awaiting man's next move in order that he might take a counter move. God is not nervous about your next move. God has always known all things which will take place. The omniscience of God is so high that he would perfectly determine the end of a thing before it ever begins. God does not have the feeling of insecurity that many people have. He sits in heaven and does whatever pleases him. He doesn't have to keep moving around like the devil to know what is happening anywhere. The moment the devil thought in his heart to exalt his throne above the throne of God, his conspiracy was uncovered and he was cast out from heaven. The devil thought he had known all about God because of his proximity to the throne of the Most High. He never knew that God's wisdom is enshrined in mysteries. If the devil that had a close proximity to the throne of God was esteemed foolish, how much more a man that thinks he can deceive God would be foolish. Psalm 147, 4 through 5 talks of the excellent wisdom of God. It says, He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord, and of great power. His understanding is infinite. Up till now, science and technology put together has not been able to determine the number of stars that are in space. But the Lord who excels in wisdom knows them all by name. There are over two billion galaxies of stars in space, and yet God can number and name them. There is no amount of words that can explain his wisdom. Christ sent a letter to the church of Ephesus with the opening word, I know your works. If you are just a believer by name and not by action, God knows. If you are serving him out of hypocrisy, he knows. There is nothing that is hidden from the wisdom of God. The heaven and the earth and all creatures under the earth are under his control. You cannot hide anything from God's knowledge. You may cover your sins and your pastor would not know, but you can never hide from God. More so, if you have been faithful in your walk with God, he knows too and will reward you at the fullness of time. James chapter one, verse five says that God is the custodian of wisdom. It is he that gives wisdom to all that lacks it. There is no wisdom elsewhere other than in God. God knows all things. He knows your trials and your endurance. He knows your pains and your afflictions. Have faith in God. We know one thing for sure, that if an angel announces the birth of someone in the Bible, it means something great is associated with that person. We see this in the prophecy of St. John the Baptist. And at the right, John was born as told by the angel. No one can argue that John was indeed a special and unique person. The major function assigned to the angel Gabriel is that of delivering good news to the people of God. Angel Gabriel is also associated with good news. He was sent to Zechariah the priest to deliver the message of the conception of John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Jesus. On a particular day, 
Zechariah went into the temple, and we see in Luke chapter 1, verse 11, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. This angel was Gabriel. Gabriel gave Zechariah the news that his wife Elizabeth would bear a son. This news was strange to Zechariah, as he said to the angel in verse 18, What proof is there for this? I am an old man, and my wife is beyond her childbearing years. In verse 19, the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in God's presence. God sent me to tell you this good news. And then continuing in verse 20, But because you didn't believe what I said, you will be unable to talk until the day this happens. Everything will come true at the right time. Also, Gabriel was sent to Mary, who became the mother of Jesus in Luke chapter 1, verses 28 through 31, with the following words. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. It was also Gabriel that appeared to Joseph, the fiancé of Mary, in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, to appeal to him to not leave Mary, because her conception was of the Holy Spirit. We know one thing for sure, that if an angel announces the birth of someone in the Bible, it means something great is associated with that person. We see this in the prophecy of St. John the Baptist. And at the right, John was born as told by the angel. No one can argue that John was indeed a special and unique person. Whilst he was still in the womb, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke 1, verse 41. And it happened, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. The angel announced the birth of Jesus Christ in the New Testament of the Bible. Matthew 1, verse 22 to 23. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. This is the first announcement of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. The announcement of the birth of Jesus started as far back as the time of the prophet Isaiah and some prophets before him. The Prophecy About the Birth of Jesus The first prophecy of his coming was made in the Garden of Eden, in Genesis 3, verse 15. Century after century passed, and it appeared as if the prophecy will never come into fruition. The prophets had been speaking for centuries. When the Anointed One comes, he shall be born of a virgin. When the Anointed One comes, strangers from afar will come holding gifts. When the Anointed One comes, he will be born in Bethlehem. When the Anointed One comes, before he begins his ministry, there will be a voice crying out in the wilderness, saying, Prepare the way of the Lord. When the Anointed One comes, he shall perform miracles. When the Anointed One comes, he will minister in Galilee. When the Anointed One comes, said the prophets. The prophets spoke of his coming centuries before he came, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, and the world saw this prophecy come into fruition. The announcement of the birth of Jesus started as far back as the time of the prophet Isaiah and some prophets before him. It did not start with the angels announcing it in the New Testament. The announcement of the angels in the New Testament is the manifestation of prophecies in the Old Testament. The prophecy we will look at is the prophecy of Isaiah. In Isaiah 7 verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And surely God was with us. This prophecy was written 700 years before Christ was born, but it was eventually fulfilled. He was Emmanuel, he was God with us, and he still is Emmanuel in our lives. In each and every one of our lives, he is Emmanuel. The name means Savior. Jesus means Jehovah saves. Everything about the Old Testament is in preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ. The events, the actions, and the words gave the view of when Jesus would come and what Jesus would do. 
we can say the Old Testament is Christ-shaped. When we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus. Some people just pray saying in the name of Jesus, but they don't know why we pray in that name. The name of Jesus is the name given to us by God. Jesus said that he is the way and that no one can go to the Father except through him. There is no way that we will pray to God and not go through Jesus. Many people pray in the world. All religions have different ways they pray. But God is telling us the only name he recognizes, the only way that leads to him, is Jesus. And that is why we pray in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is beautiful. It is a name that carries power. It is a name that can deliver. It is a name that causes a miracle to happen and it is a name that every knee must bow to. This name is great. It is all we need to use as Christians to fight our battles and overcome. When the angel announced him, he said they should name him Jesus because he will save his people. What is troubling your soul? What is giving you sleepless nights? What is that thing that has not been allowing you to be in peace? Jesus will deliver you from them all. It doesn't matter how big the trouble is. The name of Jesus is enough to conquer them for you. That name is a name that makes the troubles and problems flee. If we look at the Bible very closely from the time of Isaiah the prophet to the time the angel announced the birth of Jesus, we will notice that there are other names given to Christ, and one of them is Emmanuel. Yes, we pray using the name of Jesus. It carries a power that we need daily. But the name Emmanuel is a name that gives us an assurance that God is with us. When you remember this every day, you have the courage to face the day, and even after you pray in the name of Jesus, you know that God is with you because that's what the name of Emmanuel stands for. Who is Jesus to you? How deep are you in Christ? How well do you know Christ? If you know Christ, you will know that the name Emmanuel is not just to tell us that God is with us, but to let us know that God will always be on your side within us. What are you going through? I am telling you today that Jesus is with you. The Bible is not a joke when the Bible says, when you go through the fire, he will be with you. Isaiah 43 verse 2 When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. The disciples of Jesus were in the boat, and Jesus was with them also when the storm came. They were afraid and called unto Jesus. Jesus calmed the storm, and there was peace. The fact Christ was with them didn't mean they were not afraid. They still allowed fear in themselves. That storm you are going through, you should not be afraid, because God is with you. He will calm that storm for you. The Bible says when you go through the fire, you will not be consumed. When you go through the waters, they will not overcome you. This is the word of the Lord for you today. Stop glorifying your problems over God who is with you. Stop praising your problems and giving them more power to continue. But look at God who is with you and doing great things in you. The name of Christ is Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. Hold on to this name. Don't let it go. Don't make it something you remember annually. Don't forget about it because God is always with you. When we say God is with you, we are not saying he is with you in some parts of your life. We are saying God is with you in every area of your life. Your academics, your career, your business, your job, your family, your spiritual life, your love life, your marriage. God is in everything. Don't limit God to a part of your life. Don't push him to the part of your family affairs alone and leave him out of your business. Don't leave God out of your career. God is with you, and then make him be in every area of your life. This message is a message of hope and courage for you to rise and start walking again. If you have been beaten down by the power of life and it seems it's just overcome you, God is right there with you, telling you to stand up. Micah 7 verse 8 says, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. 
When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Let this be your testimony too. Rise, for God is with you. Isaiah 60 verse 1 Arise, shine, for thy light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. In what part of your life am I saying God is with you? These areas cover the whole of your life and what surrounds it. God is with you in your battles. This is the word of the Lord to you. You are not fighting alone. Open your eyes and see the host in heaven fighting for you. Look at yourself and see God with you fighting your battles. What will happen to you is that you will hold your peace. Exodus 14 verse 14 The Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. God sees your struggles, but he is not leaving you. What are the battles you are fighting in your life right now? Are they in your place of work? Are these battles in your family? Are these battles manifesting in your studies, your career, and your plans in life? Know this, child. God is with you. Don't panic. This is what God is telling you. Don't be afraid. Fear shouldn't be what you allow now when you know God is with you. Be courageous and fight knowing that God is right there with you. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6 Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Trust in the Lord. Don't just believe that your strength will help you. These battles are overwhelming. Only God can fight for you. God is with you when you go through emotional problems. There are heartbreaking times. There are things that break us and make us feel weak. We give up and lose hope because it feels to be too much for us. Are you going through something like that right now? Are you feeling down and you just don't feel there is any hope for you anymore? I want to tell you that God is with you. Losing a family member, especially the ones closest to you, brings fear, anger, and pain at the same time. These emotions are going to weigh someone down, no matter how strong the person wants to show that they are. God is with you throughout all of this. We can't just give up on God and feel He cannot help us. He will. Don't give up on God, because He will never give up on you. He will be your comforter. He will be with you. He will stay with you throughout the heartbreaks. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So, why can't you just find trust in Him and make Him your comforter? He loves you. He wants to make you forget the pain and let you feel joy again. The Presence of God the presence of God is the real nature of God that is present. The presence of God is different from the omnipresence of God. Omnipresence means God being present at all places of the universe in the same time and in the same capacity. Let's just look at the omnipresence of God for a moment. The human mind cannot comprehend this fact about God that the whole of God is here and at the same time if we go to Mars the whole of God is there. Psalms 139 verse 7 and 8 Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. 1 Kings 8 verse 27 But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, how much less this temple which I have built. Now there is a distinct difference between the omnipresence of God and the manifested presence of God. For instance, David pleads to the Lord not to take away his presence after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Psalms 51 verse 11 Do not cast me away from your presence. 
and do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. You see, during the times of the Old Testament, the Spirit of God was sent by God to carry His presence for a specific purpose here on earth. During the Old Testament times, the Spirit of God could be given by God and taken back by God Himself as He wished. And that is to why David in Psalms 51 verse 11 could cry to the Lord not to take His presence from Him. But in the dispensation of the New Testament, the presence of God comes to abide with a believer and dwell in him forever. Jesus promised that whoever loves him, he will be loved by his Father and both him and his Father will come and make a dwelling place in him. John 14 verse 23 Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Apart from God the Father and the Son coming to make their home in anyone who loves Jesus Christ and keeps God's word, there is a promise of the Holy Spirit that comes to make a dwelling place in a believer. John 14 verse 15 and 16 If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. This is what we call the amazing grace of God, God making his dwelling place in man. This is the great mystery the prophets of the old were searching to find out when this would happen. Even angels desire to look into. 1 Peter 1 verse 10 to 12 Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. Who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. You see, this was a great mystery for the prophets, but for us it is our reality. In the Old Testament the presence of the Lord was only found in the temple. That is why the believers in the Old Testament could say that they are going into the presence of God as they approached the temple. But when Jesus Christ died at the cross, the curtains of the temple were cut into two and the presence of God left the temple to prepare to come in us from the day of Pentecost. Therefore, those who have believed in Jesus Christ carry the presence of God wherever they go. God no longer dwells in the temples built by human hands. Look at what Apostle Paul told the men of Athens as he was addressing the Areopagus. Acts 17 verse 24 until 28 God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord, in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, 
for we are also his offspring. This now means those who have believed in Jesus Christ and have been filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit carry the presence of God wherever they go. You see, what was a mystery to prophets, what was a mystery to the great men of God is our reality. You see, you are never alone. No child of God, you are never alone. The Spirit of God is with you. The great mystery of old has been revealed. God is living in you. The early church and the apostles knew this fact very well, and that is to why through them great miracles, signs and wonders happened. They always prayed to God to refill them with the Holy Spirit and walked manifesting God's presence anywhere they went. Even their shadows could heal the sick. Acts 5 verse 12 to 15 And through the hands of the apostles many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets, and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Do you know what this tells me? This tells me that there is a level of infilling of the Holy Spirit that I am yet to reach. The same is for you. We should continue to a hunger and thirst for more of the Holy Spirit. Imagine the life of Peter living in the reality of the presence of God, so much so that the presence of God radiated, even in his shadow. God is living in you. You see, the Holy Spirit is a person you see. He is not a wish. He is not a nice thought for Christians to believe in. That we are never alone. No, he is God. God. Can you imagine what that will do for you? God living in you? You see, God had this planned out from the beginning of time, that his presence will dwell with you. And now you can know that what he had planned before you were created is now yours. God anticipated the pleasure of living and abiding with you, and now you by the blessed Holy Spirit, can come into the glory and the experience of having Him and knowing Him in all fullness. You get to live the wonder and intimacy of the indwelling God, one with you. Living in the presence of God, do you realize that God is in you? Do you understand the gravity of that statement? Preaching this reminds me of the old quote, There but while God and I shall be, I am his and he is mine. Rage, you devil, if you want. Mock your scoffers if you wish. Come wind, come weather, come good, come evil, day or night, time or eternity. I know that I am his and he is mine. Glory be to God.